ongoing exchanges. The worst situation is that the president has been drugged by the so-called Polvoron uh, video where he is being accused of sniffing uh, uh, cocaine, which is a very sensitive portion. And dealing with this for quite a while, last night I went to bed very late, 2 o'clock, and I fell asleep. And very, very funny, I uh, prob probably was affected by the so-called uh, pulboron exchanges. Because what came into my dream was no less than our uh, national hero, Jose Rizal. And I gathered a, uh, a USB where uh, his, uh, he was in a private, uh, he, he was really in his uh, bathroom and was playing some little naughty games. No, he was not sipping uh, uh, cocaine. He was playing with his uh, precious team, imagining uh, perhaps a beautiful lady. So the question is, uh, in, in my dream, if I were holding on to that USB and I were to share that USB with some other friends, would the uh, would Jose Rizal in the in the in the dream being the president be able to take action against me for showing an event which is very private for him? And so this is how this whole situation came about. And I woke up and I was smiling. I was looking for the USB. I didn't have the USB, of course. It was in the dream. And so we will start with a premise that it is Jose Rizal, who is now president of the Philippines or Filipinas. And there is a video which we will disguise as Rizal's Polboron video to put it as parallel to uh, the uh, uh, intrigue about having a BBM Polvoron video likewise. And so, without much ado, let us uh, get out of my sleep and dream and start with our presentation of this little political battle that is going on. Let me therefore share with you the bigger picture and I already recorded this uh, early, started about 3 o'clock. And after uh, going through it for, I think, almost uh, for more than three hours, some I checked and it looks like something went wrong with my recording. And so uh, what I'm doing now is do a second round of the recording. But the first recording, which was not yet complete after two, more than three hours, would probably be rerun now in two stages. I will run these slides up to the portion of the premature power struggle. And then we will cut that uh, thing as one, the, the module one for this upload. Then we go to module two, where we start discussing the concept of ignorance of fact and of the law. And we end up with the perfection, imperfection of democracy as our part two. So uh, uh, the approach here would be that there is this particular intramural, political intramural too early that started in very late 2003 and now it's entering 2004. And the big challenge is... Uh, some noise uh, creators have said uh, Bong Bong Marcos will not reach 2028. And I voted for him and I expect him to be our president up to 2028. And so we'll go through the some uh, conceptual framework of what is a state. And in the element of the state, you will see their people and we will talk about the sovereign people. 
which is way ahead of the discussion on the Constitution. And so with this framework, we now proceed to the power uh, struggle between Martin Romualdez and the Dutertes. And uh, there are uh, what we will pick up here would be certain events, about six events, that would show the ping pong game between uh, Martin uh, Romualdez hitting the ball, reaching the other side, the other side picking up the, uh, the serve and returning the ball and so on. We will have about six of them and we will have our own share of commentaries. Now, after uh, we are done with that, we uh, interrupt so that we go to the uh, second module where we will start with the uh, proposed uh, manifesto in nine points. But uh, this time we will highlight the uh, loophole of ignorance of the law and the facts so that we would be able to introduce this is the law and it is not uh, consistent with what is being said. So without much ado, let now start uh, with uh, the uh, concept of the state. In 20, uh, no, not 20, but uh, in 1913, the leading uh, nations of the world, spearheaded by the United States of America, suggested to a number of uh, equally reputable states to assemble in Montevideo in Uruguay so that they can among themselves agree on how to handle countries and former colonies who are starting to seek uh, international recognition as independent and sovereign states. And so it was in Montevideo, Uruguay, where the leading nations sat down and defined the four elements of a state to be recognized as such. And they came up with four components of a, re a state to be given recognition as a sovereign state. The first one would be people. Second would be territory, third would be government, and fourth would be sovereignty. And in between government and sovereignty, we bring in the so-called police power of the state to ensure that the government can command obedience uh, to the policies that the bigger uh, aggregation of people would demand from each and every member of the people uh, component so that the state can now move in a standard and uh, orderly manner. So that is the essence of the Montevideo doctrine, the uh, state which wants international recognition as sovereign, a sovereign state then that particular aggrupation should have the four elements of people, territory, government, and sovereignty. Having said that, we now visit the first element of a state, which is the sovereign people. And here, it has been identified that the fundamental role of uh, a state is contained in that beautiful concept called Salus Populi es Suprema Lex. Salus Populi es Suprema Lex, you know, just to get us to all be impressed with some of these Latin uh, precepts. But the real simple meaning of that is uh, the welfare of the people is the supreme law. You, know? you can see that Salus Populi. Salus is uh, salud, you know, welfare, populist people. And then, you know, of course, lex is law, so supreme law. The welfare of the people is the supreme law, which has uh, evolved to be called the general welfare clause. 
So no state can uh, be organized as a sovereign state unless its primary purpose of forming itself into a state is to render, you know, welfare to its people. And that is the supreme law. That is the reason for existence. And so when you look at, therefore, a state as it functions now, the ultimate test of whether or not there is essence in the existence of the state is to test it against the Salus Populi doctrine, we will call it. Meaning, is the aggregation of those people during their activities so that what is given as an overriding uh, guide is the welfare of the people. Yeah. And so having said that, these people may come up with a document to, doc to, to essentially uh, evidence exactly what they as a people have agreed upon. And this would also allow them to uh, organize their uh, agent of administration, their government. And the constitution would allow them to define what is the overriding power of the sovereign people and what are the guidelines that they would give to their created agency, the government, who will have to perform certain given tasks. In whatever way you looked at it, the objective is the people will be served so that the people likewise have to remain as the ultimate sovereign power. So on top of the entire uh, being, no, the 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 uh, the, the uh, what do you call this? The complexity of the state itself comes in by way of uh, its primary overriding objective of serving and uh, giving the utmost welfare to its people. And having said that, it becomes also a uh, complementary concept that in order for the state to render that kind of utmost service to its people, the very power, the sovereign power of that state rests ultimately to the people. And so uh, with this, we now go to uh, repeating the very essence of having a state and that is the welfare of the people being the primary concern of organizing the state. And so when a state develops or formulates a policy, a direction, a guideline, it answers the question of what and how do we as a people want to achieve our welfare. And so when you go into this kind of situation, the overriding catch basin of all of what they will try to, to think and do is still Salus Populi, which we will now popularly call the Salus Populi Decree. The ultimate welfare of the people becomes the overriding reason why the state exists. Having said that, therefore, when they have formed politically a state by the preponderance or the presence, no? preponderance, it's too high sounding, so not in the presence. You look at the difference between the lawyer. The lawyer will only, will only say the presence, and yet he can, of the, he, can, he can make himself look very impressive by saying preponderance. <laughs> but it really means the same. I, I, I'm very sorry. I get carried away also by those high-sounding, high palatin high words, but it does not uh, conform with my purpose of uh, getting you to interface with me. Because to be able to understand the law, which is by itself conceptually already difficult, the manner by which we share our uh, understanding would be to seem 
to simplify uh, the, the concept by using, of course, among other simple words and short sentences. Simple words, I can afford that. Short sentences, sometimes I get carried away trying to explain the concept. You know, the, the whole explanation becomes a little uh, lengthy. Now, when we form the state by the, pre by the presence of the elements of people, territory, government, sovereignty, the instant uh, creation of the state by operation of that understand of, of those elements, the state automatically is born with three inherent powers. Inherent by the fact of its organization, these powers are automatically there. And these powers include police power. And it is better called delegated police power because the ultimate power comes from the people. And the police power is intended to be the arm by which uh, the state, through the created government, can use its own might, its own muscle, to command obedience from the very people who form those policy guidelines. The second uh, uh, sovereign uh, power is uh, a realistic power called taxation, where the members, the, the people themselves, accept that they can uh, demand among themselves through their government the rendering of the uh, uh, utmost welfare for the people, provided there is money, to be blunt about it, there is money in order to fund, you know, th those uh, undertakings, you know, those things that the state has to do in order to provide the salus populi requirement. And so taxation is the raising of enforced contribution, and the contribution becomes uh, the lifeblood. Yun ang dugo noong state. And so without the tax collections being faithfully designed and executed, there will be no means by which to provide the, uh, what they call this, the, the flow of blood to the state almost no different from the blood that we have in the body. When you don't have blood anymore in you, then you cease to exist as a living human being. The same can be said about uh, the state, which is an artificial being. It does not need the physical blood that we have as human beings, but the very blood that it needs is money. That is why the money raises, raised from taxes is called the lifeblood of the state. And so the taxation becomes the lifeblood doctrine. The uh, third uh, sovereign power is called eminent domain. And it has a very uh, dramatic uh, historical background. By, by eminent domain, it means that intrinsically, the land uh, of the state, which is essentially the territory, belongs to the sovereign people collectively. And uh, therefore, if they need any part of the land in the exercise of the Salus Populi Doctrine, in the desire to, to, to enhance or improve or increase the welfare for the people, the state can now flex its act of literally recalling the original land that really, under the Regalian doctrine, belongs to the state. The historical background of this is in the early times when societies were being formed. The concept is that uh, the overall universe is of course coming from the universal God. But the universal God cannot attend to all the details of day-to-day -day living 
And so he ordained certain uh, individuals who came to be known as the kings. And their function is essentially to lead their people. To manage their people, ensure that they get the, uh, what they call this, the, uh, the things they need to, to live. Provide them with jobs that would provide them with the earnings. And so that therefore, the king now has been perceived to be one created by God, one who was designated by God. And he is accountable to his, for his people to God. Obviously, uh, the biggest area of his uh, power would be the territory or the land or lands where his people are staying. And so the concept of uh, the regalian doctrine started with that, that the word regalian comes from the word regal, which is synonymous to royal. And so when you talk about uh, regalian doctrine or royal doctrine, it is associated with the concept that the land came from God and was given to the king as an instrument of his uh, supervising and uh, leading his people. And so all the lands belong to the king. Now later on, when there is an evolution of the concept of where power is, some people started giving the idea that God must have been so good, he did not intend to give that single or that, that overall power only to one individual in that society. There came to pass that the power of the king has now been interpreted to really be, have been given to the people collectively. And so this is where popular uh, uh, democracy came into being, that the, the real power coming from God of running the affairs of the people are coming directly from the people themselves. And so the kings were, a number of the kings were set aside or were no longer treated as powerful as they used to be. And so with this, because the kings have effectively lost their control and responsibility over the people because the people took, took over that responsibility in his behalf. By sheer logic, the power and authority of the king over the lands move over to the, uh, to the citizenry, to the people collectively. So the lands became a collective uh, ownership of the people. And so this is where the regalian doctrine evolved from a royalty concept to a common ownership concept. But still regalian. Why? Because the people assume now the authority uh, of uh, the king. They have now what is called the sovereign power of the king transferred to them. So these are the people who exercise that power of supervision, control, and support of the very people among themselves. And so they must have also inherited the royal uh, power to take over the lands. So that is where the regalian doctrine came in. Now, in the evolution of society, as we arrive at the modern uh, uh, concept of uh, states today, most of the states never abandon the regalian doctrine. They continue to say that the land belongs to the state and it belongs to the people. Because somewhere along, I mean, to, to, be, to be logical about it, if the objective of the formation of the state is salus populi, meaning the utmost welfare for the people, the ownership and control of the land must necessarily belong to the authority who has the responsibility to taking care of the welfare of the people. So the authority control and ownership of the land has moved 
to the people in their collective capacity as the sovereign power who replace the, the kings. So, regalian pa rin ang concept. However, uh, modern society accepted that if all the lands were uh, the ownership of the, uh, of the state, and that is not totally uh, strange in regimes where uh, the control of the entire uh, politic, uh, the political situa- uh, uh, agrupation is in a centralized system then obviously all the lands belong to the supposed to be class running the whole thing. So if you have a communist state like Russia or, or China or North Korea, while the concept of serving the people and focusing on their welfare continues to be the overriding reason why they, they are organized. Instead of all the people running it, some strong groups there said that, don't worry, we will run the affairs for you. And so that therefore, the control of the land is in our hands. In the name of the sovereign state. Like in the, in the other uh, setup, it is the people collectively exercising the, the sovereign power. In certain states, there is a smaller group that takes over, you know, uh, and assumes the role of the controlling sovereign power. Yeah. And therefore, it is also in the hands of these people where the, distribu- the use and distribution of lands become vested upon. Okay. So what happens now? In a society where you have a plurality of, of people, dami, in 119 million, how do you expect 119 million individually and collectively gathering and de- managing all the resources, most importantly, is land. And so this was, uh, uh, what happened was, since the one of the elements of the created state is the government that the people will form, what happened was, the government now uh, took to exercise the sovereign power of the people over the lands. In the name of the people, parent, but there is now their government and they can always change their government because they would ultimately be the sovereign power. And so that is how the three inherent powers came into being. The moment there is the, the presence of the four elements of people, territory, government, sovereignty, then there is a state. And the moment there is a state, there are automatically uh, created uh, with them, the, with the creation of the state, the inherent powers of police power, taxation, and eminent domain. Now, but having said that, the people may say that, let us come up with a document that will define that we are the sovereign power, as the people. And we are creating our agent, the government. And so, in effect, on a day-to-day basis, and as they contend with the individual uh, members of the sovereign people, the government will appear to be uh, stronger than in the individuals. Although, collectively, the people become the overall power. But when the state deals with, when the government deals with the individual, uh, members of, of the people, society, and the government with all the full power, collective powers in their hands would appear to be stronger. And so the people said, uh, let's come up with an agreement on uh, us collectively being the power and then we create, the, we create you as our delegate. But you start dealing with us individually, and so you will exercise certain powers in behalf of collectively of the people. So let us come up with a document to, to define how our relationship would be. And that is how the Constitution came into being. The Constitution is in effect an agreement, a contract, but it is the highest contract that exists within a state. And so instead of just simply calling it contract, Instead of simply calling it sacred agreement or contract, they introduced the concept of 
covenant. The covenant is the highest and most sacred contract and created between the people collectively uh, exercising their power and delegating this power to their agent, the government, and saying that here is the sovereign master, the people, creating its own agent and telling its agent between the two of us, here is our agreement on how we will proceed in our relationship. And so that therefore, in the Philippines, when we created this constitution, and there was a, uh, we made three uh, effort to uh, define and design our constitution. We came up with the constitution that essentially has only two parts. The first part is a definition of the human rights of the people collectively and individually. And they said that we are the sovereign people and in our collective and individual capacities, there are certain human rights that we are not surrendering to the government as our agent. We will keep this and we will put that as part of our agreement in the Constitution. And that is what came to be known as the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is nothing but a short listing of the human rights that the people collectively and individually did not surrender to the government when they formed the state. Hindi nawawala sa amin yan. And so when you talk about the human rights and the Bill of Rights belonging to the sovereign people, the government can never be higher than the sovereign people or the individual members comprising that sovereign people when it deals with these human rights that have been predefined. Superior yun, because that belongs to the sovereign people at the very start. And when they created their agent government, they never gave up that particular human rights to their uh, created government. And so the human rights are those where the people never surrendered to the government. And they, some of the samples of this would be the right of a person uh, to life, to liberty or property, the right against unreasonable searches and seizure, the right to a uh, the right to speak, the right of speech, expression or uh, press, the press, the right of abode and to travel, the freedom of religion, meaning the government cannot designate any religion as an official religion. Neither can the government demand no, the uh, uh, adherence of the people towards a religion. And also, the demand that, the, that, the, that religion cannot interfere with the affairs of the state the way we saw the, pra the friars during the regime of the Spaniards. And then, of course, the right to privacy uh, of communication the right to assemble in order to uh, make known your uh, issues and complaints against how the government is running it, nothing, regress of grievance, the right to information, and all other rights that are contained in the section, Article 3 of the uh, uh, called Bill of Rights in the Constitution. So that's one group, kukunti lang yun, pero very sacred. That, that is in a corner something that uh, both the people and the government always looked up to and the government saying, hey, you cannot violate any of that against any of the members of the people. And definitely you cannot go against it collectively against the people themselves. Having said that, the people and their uh, created uh, agent, agent, the government, agreed on how the sovereign power will be delegated to the government. And so the second part of the Constitution is the design of the structure of government. 
that the design of the government has become a policy issue on how the people want to distribute the sovereign power to achieve the people's welfare. So we have this overall sovereign power that the people are holding on to. Uh, you know, we, we cannot uh, do it ourselves. 119 million Filipinos, how can we all work uh, all at the same time just doing this one? We have our own uh, obligation to ourselves to provide for food, shelter, and clothing to ourselves. And so they said, Mr. Government, who is our agent, we will now design how we will give the sovereign power to you. And so it came to pass that under the uh, Constitution of the Philippines, we adopted the uh, so-called presidential system of government, even when we are saying there is co-equal sharing of powers. And so out of these, three major agrupations of delegated power were created. One is the power, sovereign power given to the legislature. Here, it is the legislature composed of uh, representatives directly elected by the people comprising the House of Representatives and the sovereign people, you know, as an aggrupation forming uh, a Senate of 24 senators whose, who are voted upon across by all the 119 million, but in certain batches in order to ensure continuity. And so you have the legislative department that becomes the uh, venue and the means by which the people would express their aspiration, their desire, their expectation of their government to serve them. And then after the legislature, you know, working together, you know, both the lower house and the, uh, the, the Senate, would form a consensus manifesting the desire of the sovereign people for certain cho chosen uh, option, chosen projects, priorities, and so on. It gets to be approved as a law, the final uh, signature being the president. And one of the reasons why he needs to sign is because he will be the one to implement it is the office of the president under the executive department that will undertake to execute these particular plans. Again, with the overall permanent uh, objective of delivering the Salus Populi Doctrine. And finally, you bring in the judiciary who will say that we have a constitution that protects the the, the human rights of the individuals, and also define the specific roles of government. And so in the process of ensuring that the uh, uh, rights of the people continue to be protected by the, their, uh, by, by the dictate of the, by their collective decision as a people, and also the uh, coordinated workings of the agencies of government, legislative, executive, and the judiciary, we, the judicial arm of the government will ensure that any conflicts would be resolved with our initiative. Yeah. And of course, if there are any uh, conflicting uh, uh, claim of rights of individuals, then it is also us in the judiciary through our courts who will determine the respective rights of everybody who has to be given what he deserves by way of rights. On the other hand, there were three agencies. They are not as big as the legislature, the executive, or judiciary, but they were given very specific, powerful, sovereign functions. One of them is the Commission on Audit. The other one is, of course, the COMELEC. And the third one is the Civil Service Commission. In the reverse, the Civil Service Commission would ensure that those who work with the government will continue to be given that job for as long as they perform their duties according to, uh, to, to, to the concept of their position. The COMELEC, of course, handles the continuing uh, up, upgrade, I mean, not upgrade, the continuing uh, 
uh, uh, what you call this uh, uh, succession of government uh, elected positions that would cover both the local governments and the national governments. They handle the process of uh, putting up candidates who are coming in either to replace old ones that are no longer uh, available or they they would uh, they would somehow uh, place people by way of orchestrating the entire 119 million or right now the registered voter of about one half of that 60 million would be the one to cast their votes in the in the appointment of all the officials from the local government officials to the national uh, officials to include the president. So we will talk more about the commission and audit because this is an issue that was raised. So moving now to our chart, we are about to enter the last of the first stage, which is the premature power struggle. We will now enter the uh, political arena of battle between Martin Romualdez and the people who are supporting him against the Dutertes who have their own set of people. So we go now to the premature power struggle. The premature power struggle started with House Speaker Martin Romualdez prematurely starting his 2028 political momentum. May ambition pala yung mama. And obviously, he recognizes that it is the Duterte political empire that he has to contend with. Candidly, it's just too early for him. You know, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos was elected and took office only in 2022. So 2023 is about one and a half uh, years. And so he's entering only, he's about to finish his second year and entering his third year. So 2028 is still a long uh, way to go for Romualdez to start uh, flexing his political muscle. Well, from his point of view, uh, an early bird catches worms. But it is also true, an early bird can be the first one to die in the, uh, if the bird uh, goes to a, a, the more dangerous uh, place uh, intending to feed himself. Yeah, yun ang danger ng, ng, uh, ng early, you know, <laughs> early or premature uh, uh, entry uh, in, in the whole political ball game. Pwedeng nauna ka, therefore nakalamang ka, O pwedeng ikaw ang unang mamatay kasi nakaabang yung kalaban pala ready rin. In the process, there will be conflicts kasi merong, may mga intended vested interests. And in the meantime, both, part, both sides of the potential political uh, battle should allow themselves a little uh, window to develop, you know, uh, accomplishments that they can bring to the people so that they become favored. Ano nangyari? Bumato kagad si Martin Romualdez. In his first move, is, uh, he, he, he got the uh, intelligence uh, feedback that GMA acting for the Duterte alignment no, is uh, moving around among the congressmen to declare the position of Martin Rombaldes vacant. And if he, she were to accomplish that, then she would have the opportunity to be nominated as the new speaker. And so they would have control of the Congress because he is aligned with Duterte and they would they would therefore ease out si, si Martin Rombaldes from the power uh, from the power picture. But Romualdez felt that uh, ganun, ha? so he, he immediately also uh, took his preemptive move. He removed 
Gloria Macapagal Arroyo initially as deputy, uh, senior deputy speaker. And later on, not even a deputy speaker. So, uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo lost her senior uh, position in the House of Representatives in November of 2023, bago lang magpasko. Now, along this line, uh, uh, Romualdez also went into his second round. And when the, the budget uh, for 2024 was being considered, he took a look at the 650 million included in the budget of Sara Duterte for the, Secre for the Department of Education. And it appears, according to Sara Duterte, that Romualdez knew that she will be using those funds in order to counter uh, man the penetration of the schools by the uh, Communist Party, uh, CPP, NPA. In spite of that knowledge, uh, uh, Sara learned that through the leadership of uh, Speaker Romualdez, the intelligence fund for the Department of Education. But in fairness, all the conf uh, confidence, confidential funds were removed from all the offices. Para naman, hindi naman siya lang natamaan. And they were all transferred to the Central Intelligence Agency uh, under the office of the President. And that same move no, was carried over to the Senate. The Senate also removed all the confidential funds. So, uh, so Sara Duterte was saying, I needed those funds to fight uh, the communist penetration of my schools. But somewhere, Romualdez is probably saying, sure, you can use some of those money, but you can keep an, um, a big chunk of that money as part of your, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, financial resources for the 2028 presidential matter. So I will remove the already... I will remove that kind of resource for you so you don't have any funds to uh, contend with me. Well, the Duterte camp uh, started, I mean, came back with their uh, second muscle, which is through their media arm, the SMNI. They orchestrated now no, uh, a certain uh, review where they felt that Romualdez must be cornering also some 1.8 million in travel funds in his budget. And because uh, Romualdez kept uh, going with the president on the foreign travel, they started SMNI, Laban Kasama ng Bayan, headed by Jeffrey Selis and also Dr. Uh, uh, Badoy started reporting that Speaker Romualdez uh, had travel expenses amounting to 1.8 billion and he is not even able to account for it. Of course, uh, Romualdez came back with vengeance by whispering to his allies in the House of Representatives. You know, this SMNI seems to be uh, the uh, propaganda arm of uh, Duterte. So, why don't you consider looking, uh, taking a look at their uh, operation? And that is what uh, brought about the Committee on Franchise, chaired by uh, Congressman uh, Gas Tambunting, to call the SMNI leadership to answer questions about the way they are operating their franchise. Well, it was a very uh, heated uh, atmosphere when the Congressional uh, Committee was hearing and demanding explanation from uh, Dr. Badoy and uh, Jeff Selis. And so, uh, if you listen uh, carefully to Congressman Pimentel, he said that SMNI has been violating a number of their, uh, uh, what they call these uh, conditions 
for operating their franchise. And so that therefore, since Congress uh, was the one who approved into law the franchise of SMNI, Congress has also the prerogative to look into whether or not the basis for their uh, application to approve the SMNI uh, is being adhered to. So that's the reason why they called for this hearing. But you know, the political atmosphere uh, was prevalent. You know, those who were probably neutral or did not care except the uh, honest workings of the committee. But there were also some who were, you know, who have uh, geared themselves to be uh, the uh, trigger men, you know, the assassinators or the assassins against SMNI. And so they raised the question, uh, is it true, Mr. SMNI, that you uh, release as a news item and lambasted uh, Senate, I mean, uh, uh, Speaker Martin Romualde saving a 1.8 billion travel expense. And uh, they said, where did you get that information? Because the congressmen were sizing up, there might be some leakage also among themselves. But Celis replied, invoking the Soto law <coughs> that the, does not allow anybody to question the source of any news by a uh, by a media practitioner. And Celis is saying, I'm, we are media practitioners. We have the right under the freedom of speech not to reveal our sources. And so this uh, kind of questioning led uh, from one stressful comment to another until ultimately the committee ruled that the refusal of Celis to disclose who, he, uh, who is the source of uh, information on the 1.8 billion travel expense of the speaker uh, would merit a uh, house arrest for contempt. And in a similar vein, Dr. Badoy was also slapped that kind of penalty. Yeah. So, yun. Temporarily nakukulong sila. Expected doon sila magpapasko sa quarters sa House of Congress. Of course, uh, these people know how to handle that with their lawyers. They went up to the Supreme Court to for a petition for uh, habeas corpus. Tama nga naman. Eh, ba't nyo kami kukulong dito? Now, the congressman realized that uh, the threat of uh, Supreme Court issuing an order for the release of the two would have embarrassed uh, them. So the Congress, uh, on its own initiative, before the Supreme Court can issue a, an order of the release of the two SMNI senior executives, uh, the committee released them. So there was a saving phase. But the uh, Romualdez uh, clan uh, doesn't appear to have ended up its uh, continuing uh, legal battle or, or political battle with the Dutertes. And so, Cousin Romualdez must have whispered to Cousin Mr. President, you know, Duterte seems to be... Uh, uh, continuing to behave like he's still the president. Perhaps we should uh, keep him quiet by bringing in the prosecutors of the International Criminal Court. <laughs> now, before Duterte uh, stepped down from the office of the president, he submitted a resignation to the International Criminal Court of the, uh, where the Philippines therefore uh, cut its uh, relationship with the ICC. That immediately prevented the ICC from coming to the Philippines because it would uh, the, the, the Philippines is taking the position that in any of these uh, killings associated with the war on drugs, you know, the campaign against uh, drugs, 
the local Philippine courts can handle any consequent uh, criminal action against whoever may be undertaking the killings. And that particular move, therefore, prevents ICC from entering into the picture, more so because uh, the Philippines is no longer a member of ICC. However, if you go a little uh, deeper, the membership uh, with the ICC of the Philippines will still allow an investigation of any uh, extraordinary killings uh, that would happen within the one-year period after resignation. And all of those killings that happened before the resignation from 2006 up to the time that the Philippines uh, tended this resignation, who knows, November, December of 2022, then the cases will continue to be under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. But uh, BBM, in a show of support to President Duterte, together with, of course, Senator Bato de la Rosa, who is also in trouble and, uh, with the ICC. Uh, BBM reiterated its open position against the ICC's entry to investigate this, uh, uh, what you call this uh, anti-narcotics campaign of former President uh, Duterte. And so what ultimately happened was he made a declaration, no, ICC, you do, you do not come here. But, uh, you know, the political intrigues continued where the Dutertes are hearing that, well, in public, BBM is saying, no, we don't welcome the IC ICC to protect President Duterte. In reality, he was already giving instructions indirectly to allow the ICC investigators to be uh, in town and start silently their investigation. So, sabi ng mga Duterte, this is not fair. You know, the, what they're saying in public is not what is happening behind the scenes. And so Duterte, again, launched his uh, counter-attack where he says, okay, you want to kill me by way of prosecuting me before the uh, International Court of Justice. Therefore, let me, I'm sorry, 